you want to just take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 100, we'll start with that. And uh, we're going to do some more music here in a little bit, but uh, got a few other things we want to do. Is that coming through okay? All right. Page number 619 in the Red Bibles, and it's uh, Psalm 100. And uh, maybe by the time we're done reading these five verses, you'll already know what we're going to talk about. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. We hear a lot of talk about IQ. We know that's the intelligence quotient, and everybody varies to some extent on that. And we hear quite a bit about the EQ, the emotional quotient, how people can handle life or not handle life. But today we're going to talk about GQ. (laughs) Anybody know what it is? Gratitude quotient. Do you see, we were em- I was trying to emphasize Thanksgiving. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And um, as part of that, uh, we're going to have uh, Paul come up here in a little bit and give a short report of whatever he has on his mind. But I'll, I'll kind of pave the way for that. By s- One month ago, which happened to be February 8th, and this is March 8th, one month ago we ate our lunch like normal here. And then people started bringing food in and bringing food in. And, and we're like, well, when is it going to stop? And we found out, I guess, it was pickup loads of food. So I got a copy of the Lakeview Covenant uh, Church's bulletin off the, um, off the Internet and uh, found this little paragraph on there. Sunday, February 8th, Operation Empty Shelves. Lakeview is partnering with Super One Foods to meet the urgent need to fill the food bank shelves at Union Gospel Mission. Today only from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., make plans to invade the Lakeside and Kenwood Super One locations to empty the store's shelves and fill the shelves at at UGM. Trucks located at the stores do not bring donations to church. And so I understand they did exactly that. They actually had uh, pickup trucks parked outside the the stores, and that, that was amazing. Paul will probably tell you more. Northland News also did it the next day. They did something on... Uh, same day I believe it doesn't take a community to make a difference it says massive food drive in Duluth fills shelves of Union Gospel Mission but when neighbors come together for that purpose it can certainly make a huge impact that was the case Sunday morning when over 600 Lakeview Covenant churchgoers descended upon Duluth Super One stores in Lakewood and Kenwood the goal purchase as much food and drink as possible to help stock the food shelf at the Union Gospel Mission which basically ran drier over this week Not only did members of the congregation buy food to fill the dozen or so pickup trucks at both locations, but they also encouraged other Northlanders to do the same. Organizers say the result was humbling. They're coming with a bigger truck and unloading the smaller trucks, filling it up, driving it to our church and setting it on the stage, said Courtney Bain of the Lakeview Covenant Church, and it's it's full already. It's full, and we still have a ways to go. I mean, every single person is buying stuff. Event organizers hope the drive will also raise awareness of local food shelves needs so events like this don't have to happen to make a difference. So I uh, noticed too that there's a video, a 58 second video on YouTube under number one US TV called Mission Food Drive. I don't know if if Paul knows that's on there or not, but it, it gives a little clip about this particular food drive. Uh, and that went on almost immediately too. So that uh, sets the stage. I thought this was the appropriate time to talk about this and uh, make it more public because we're talking about gratitude this morning, today. And one of the ways that we show gratitude is by giving. And these people gave in a big way. And I would like Paul to come up and uh, tell a few, th- say what's on his mind right now. Uh, Well, we got 15,108 pounds of food that came in from this food drive. Uh, uh, 
to us that's about two months of a supply. Uh, we look at this as, as a modern day miracle because we were out of food and we were considering closing our food shelf. And uh, to see this type of support is just overwhelming. Uh, I got the opportunity to thank the church at their services last week and at the first service I got up, all I could sit there and do is sit there and bawl for about 30 seconds. Uh, uh, the emotion just pours out of you. you know, so it is a miracle when people come together and uh, the thing I learned about it is that miracles aren't just in the Bible, they are today. And, uh, and it's when people get together and make a group effort and we can create miracles. That's the good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, he said that he, he got up and he had to cry. I, actually, tears are a language, you know, and sometimes that's more powerful than words. Uh, so I think that was, that's what you felt and that's what you did and that was good. But, uh, so I think the next song is very fitting. I, sh I wanted to say too, Paul is the executive director here at the mission for those who might see this on YouTube. So uh, thank you for those words, Paul. The next song is Great Is Thy Faithfulness, which I think really fits with what we're talking about right now this morning. So uh, that's at page, on page 98. 98, I believe it is. Am I right about that? Page 98. Great is thy faithfulness. song in a little bit. Uh, it's going to be page 363, To God Be the Glory. Just want to make a couple announcements before we go to that. 
I've, uh, yeah, I do a lot of reading, and so I s decided to sometimes make a part of our presentation here to recommend a book. And I just read the book Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by Nabil Qureshi. And I would highly recommend that for anyone that wants an insight. I would say a kind insight into the whole issue of Islam versus Christianity. He was a, he's a Pakistani, was a Pakistani Muslim, converted to Jesus, and writes the book in a very kind way toward his parents who were very good to him. But uh, it's, a, it's a book I think uh, somebody would find interesting. Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by Nabil Qureshi. I recommend that. I had also earlier announced that we were going to start the book of Acts, a series on the book of Acts. And um, I guess I feel led in a different way for the present time, and I uh, hope that's okay. I'm not even sure how many of you remember me saying that, but I think we're going to just go month by month. But for the next four months, Lord willing, I think we're going to talk about the issues that every human being tries to thinks a lot about and tries to find answers to, and that is origins, meaning, morality, and destiny. So I think we're going to take one of those per month going forward here, and next month then, Lord willing, it'll be about origins. All the Bible, reference, all the Bible reading we do today, as, all, as usual here at the Union Gospel Mission, will be in the New King James Version, because that is the Bible that's here. Just want to make a note of that. And um, I saw two corrections I need to make on the last video which uh, came out on YouTube from last month's service. And as I watched it, I watched it critically, of course, and, and I saw that I said, and probably no one cares about this, but I'm big on details, so I said that Paul stayed in Corinth longer than he stayed anywhere else, and I think I was wrong. Did anybody pick that up? I think he stayed in Ephesus longer than he did in Corinth, so correction. And I also said near the end, give me five more minutes, and I took 12, and that's not okay. <laughs> so I'm sorry for that. I'll try to do better. If I say five, I'll try to be five, not 12. So those are the two things I thought I should acknowledge as a correction. And um, so we have this next song. Uh, what page did I say it is? 362. 368. 363. So 363, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It is, to God be the glory, I'm sorry, 363, yeah, okay. Oh, 
right. Thanks to all of you for coming today. We appreciate everyone that comes to the church service here at the Union Gospel Mission. Let's begin by prayer this morning. Lord, we just thank you for your many blessings to us. We thank you that you have given us all these gifts to enjoy. Most of all, you have given your son Jesus and the plan of salvation. Lord, help us to be grateful people and help us to be challenged this morning from your word about the need to be grateful uh, for all the blessings that we have. Thank you for everyone who has come. We pray that we would have a good time together. In your name we pray. Amen. So, what is your GQ? That was the question we asked. Uh, what is your gratitude quotient? Quotient being, how much gratitude do you have? When you think of uh, gratitude, thankfulness, uh, contentment, cheerfulness, generous, all those th words, who do you think of? Do you think of any person that you know? Just curious. Don't, don't say it, just think. And then I wonder, as people look at me, or people look at you, do they say, oh yeah, that person, you're, you're, that, that's a generous person. That's a person filled with gratitude. Do they see you as a person of gratitude? You know we've met, we met both kinds, right? Uh, in our Minneapolis ministry, in one of the soup kitchens we go to, I've never heard this here, thank God, but I hear people that are leaving the soup kitchen, walking past other people, and they say something like, oh, what are they having in there? Already the way they ask is no gratitude. What are they having in there? And I, look, I hear this more often than I like, for sure. And they'll say, garbage. <laughs> and the place serves wonderful meals. And I think, how could somebody be so ungrateful? Garbage? So you see this. We go in and we sit down at the table. We just heard somebody say it's garbage. We go down in and sit at the table. And then we meet people there. They're just like, this food is so good in this place. And it's the same food prepared by the same people in the same place. But it's all about attitude. Oh, I know there's natural likes and dislikes, but this is beyond that. This is, this is attitude. And I think attitude in our life is one of the well, it's, it's one of the most important things in life. And gratitude is an attitude. And lack of gratitude is also an attitude. So this whole thing this morning is about gratitude and uh, being more grateful for the blessings we have. Last, week, re last month, remember, we talked about the wilderness, the state of the wilderness, the murmuring in the wilderness. It mentions in um, Numbers 14.22 that there, was, there were ten transgressions or things that the Israelites did in the wilderness that, that, up, that up displeased God. And I believe six of those were murmuring, complaining. It was like, well, I'm going to go back to Egypt again. We used to have leeks and garlics and all that. And ungratefulness is not okay with God because he knows that he has given us all things freely to enjoy. And it's not okay. So uh, he was very uh, uh, not happy with them in that time, and he's not happy with us if we're un ungrateful. But ungratefulness can be very subtle. And the reason it could be so subtle is because we make comparisons that we should not make. And we make the unhealthy comparisons, and we begin to think we're not as blessed as we should think we are. Uh, it is really an issue... And I'm largely talking in the context of Christian thinking here. It is largely an issue of dark and light. If uh, Ungratefulness definitely comes from the dark side. And gratefulness comes from the light side. And Jesus is the light of the world. And when Jesus is in the picture, there's gratefulness in the picture. So those are some of the uh, opening comments here that I wanted to make about the subject. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, there's a, verse, a couple verses that um, you don't have to turn to this. You can easily just listen to it and, and, and really get it. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. This book, 2 Timothy, is the last book that Paul wrote. Some people call it the cry of a dying conqueror. 
Paul is in a situation, he's in dire straits. He's going he's gonna to die pretty soon, and he pretty much knows it here when he writes this book. Not very long after he wrote this, he was actually beheaded. So he's, there's not a hint in this book from Paul of complaining. But he says in chapter uh, 3 of 2 Timothy, verses 1 and 2, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Perilous means dangerous, uh, among other things. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And it goes on from there. But uh, that's a a verse that... uh, it stands out as a picture of unthankfulness and what God really thinks of it. Personally, well, I should mention this too. There, there's the fruit of the Spirit which is outlined for us in Galatians chapter 5. And again, you don't need to turn to this. But this is what it says as a summary of the list of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit being nine fruits in one basket. So it's a the fruit. We should all as Christians be showing forth some of this. And it will be by degrees. So some people are just starting out. Others are much more mature. It will be by degrees. But here, here's the list. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Nine fruits that make one composite fruit, and all of them are product of living in a state of gratitude or high GQ. Actually, if you go down that list and scrutinize them, I don't think you're going to be able to fit any of them into a, 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 a person's lifestyle that is a state, in a state of ungratefulness. When I say in a state of, I hope you understand, we drift into these things. We, I, if I live in a state of gratefulness, that means that I am a grateful person. But there's times when I get ungrateful feelings. But that doesn't take me out of the state. That's what I'm trying to say. Whether it's totally theologically correct, I'm not sure, but I know what I mean. I hope you know what I mean. We, we are generally a grateful person, or we are generally an ungrateful person. So uh, one of the interesting things it says after it mentions this list of the fruit of the Spirit, it says, against such there is no law. You don't need to make laws about good things. No law, no laws needed against good things. Take this to the limit. Do you mean, for instance, somebody, does anybody ever come to you and complain, I don't like that person, he loves too much, he's just too kind, he's too gentle. You never hear that. You don't even think that, unless it's false. I mean, sometimes you meet somebody that gives you a feeling of falseness. But if it's, if it's genuine, you're always like, you're never complaining about that. It's all good. So um, take it to the limit. There are no limits. There's no law against them and no law which will produce them either. You could not produce any of these by your own effort. This fruit is uh, the harvest of living in a state of gratitude and not just an occasional spurt. It is supernatural. It's Holy Spirit living and it comes from a vital relationship with Jesus. Personally, I think I have a lot of gratitude. I think some of my most gratitude-filled moments are in the morning when I'm sitting there by myself and thinking about my life and I have a lot of gratitude. But I want more. I want to be more grateful. I'm not as grateful as I should be. That's where I find myself. I ebb and flow too much, and yet God's mercy and promises are constant. Last month we talked about the promised land. We talked about Canaan land, where we are secure, where we're, where we're settled in our faith and all that. And uh, this, this also is a quality that can become quite settled, and I'm not there where I want to be on it. I think I'm too much a product of some of the uh, easy times that we've had in our life. When I am strong, my GQ is highest. When I'm strong in gratitude, then, of course, that's an, no, that doesn't uh, need to be said. <clears throat> How can we discuss this without desiring more gratitude that produces fruit for the kingdom? The Bible says, in everything, give thanks. Give thanks in spiritual things. If we did not have anything else but Jesus, we would have enough to praise God for all eternity. That's all. 
Praise God in the simple things. We should be thankful for family, friends, health, food, and even a glass of water. I remember years ago in our uh, Los Angeles outreach, we met a, um, a man from Ethiopia. His name was Tadaku, and he later came to Wisconsin and visited with some of us. And before he, uh, <clears throat> we gave him a glass of water, and he bowed his head, and he prayed and thanked for it, th gave thanks for it. And I just said to him, uh, we're, we're pretty much used to praying and thanking God for our food, but we never do take the time to th thank God for water. He said, well, you haven't watched six million of your people die from starvation either. With, he said, I saw that happen, and he said, I can't drink a glass of water without thanking God. Now, that was, that was nothing put on about that. That was real for him because of what he had gone through. And those are the things that uh, make people more grateful sometimes. And, and um, I actually think there's a real challenge to be as grateful as we should with all the plenty that we have. And uh, you see that in a lot of wastefulness and a lot of uh, taking things for granted. And we need to do better about that because if we do better, we can help more people. We also, we also give thanks in this <clears throat> sorrowful things. <clears throat> I know Stan is going through something there. He, uh, he can tell you about it if he wants with one of his family members. And uh, we come to these, these uh, critical junctures in our life where we don't have answers. We, we pray our hearts out and the answer doesn't come the way we think it should or we wish it would. And yet we need to commit it to God and go on. And we can find some kind of... a. Uh, uh, peace and um, gratitude even in those things if our hearts are right with God. I think it, it rests a lot in really being burrowed into the promises of God and really believing the promises of God. When he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, did he mean it or not? And when we, the more we can rest our case on verses like that, the more we can be grateful even in the circumstances that are hard to go through. So we can and should even be thankful for heartaches, pains, and suffering. Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for good. Um, and here I'll recommend another book that I read a while back called uh, The Gift of Pain by Paul Brandt, co-authored with Philip Yancey, a wonderful book about this subject. Changed my perspective about some of this idea of pain and, and how we feel toward pain and all that. The thing may not be good or pleasant, but God is in the details. I believe that is the way things work out. So... We should probably go to one of the main scriptures that I want to use now. There's so many verses in the Bible about thankfulness. This is really, this is really in the Old and New Testament all over the place. But let's go, to, um, let's go to Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. Luke chapter 17, 11 to 19. <clears throat> This story is not a parable. There's a lot of parables in there's a lot of parables in the book of Luke, but this is a true story of a situation that happened right near the end of Jesus' ministry. Luke chapter 17 verses 11 to 19. Um, actually, between verses 10 and 11, if you're looking at your Bible, the whole it's the whole story that unfolds in John chapter 11 where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that happens between verse, verse 10 and 11 in Luke 17. You understand what I'm saying? This whole, the Gospels are not necessarily chronological, so John is mostly chronological, but the others are not. And so it really is of interest to me to find out where, they are, where he's at on his journey from when he first started in the ministry and how close to the cross he is. So what we're looking at right here is something that happened about 30 days before he was crucified. So maybe that gives some context to you, to, to you about this. So between verse 10 and verse 11, in Luke chapter 17, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. So let's read this scripture. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. Ten men with leprosy. Leprosy is a type of sin. I'm not going to talk about that a lot, but, but uh, that's what it is. And, and, uh, but it's also a, a disease. 
And in this particular setting, when they had leprosy, they were not to have any contact with anyone. When they walked through the streets, they were to, there was a distance that uh, the priest had, uh, I guess God had given direction on this in, back in the book of Leviticus, that they had to keep a certain distance. And if I was walking by through you here, I would have to be going unclean, 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 and you would all be backing away from me. So that's the kind of life these men were living. They couldn't mingle with anyone. They were outcasts. And so um, that's why they stood afar off, verse 12. I already read that, but let me read it again. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. I'm going to make some comments as I read it here. Just, just stay right there. Um, they stood afar off. They had to stand afar off. And they cried loudly because they had to stand afar off. They somehow had believed or at least hoped that there was help come, to come from Jesus. They were desperate. This might have been the only ten lepers in this little community. And they didn't care what they were at that point. They were all lepers and they got together because that's all they could get together with. So they congregated. And so maybe that's all there was, ten of them. Have mercy, they said. And Jesus, in verse 14, so when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. They had to go to be cleansed. Because Jesus said, Go to the priest." There's a lot to be said about this, but there had not been that many people healed of leprosy. Uh, there's only two in the Old Testament that I can think of that are shown have to be healed of leprosy, and many, many were not healed. And so it had some kind of a messianic message to the people if leprosy was healed. So without going deep into the details here, can you see why Jesus said, go show the priest? Because in Leviticus chapter, I believe, 13 and 14, it's clearly outlined that the only way they could begin to mingle with the people again is if the priest clears them. So now, most of the priests were not believing in Jesus, did not want to believe in Him, and that they were against Him. So Jesus says, go to the priest, and as they went, they were healed. So when they showed up at the priest... These ten men that were sitting around with leprosy and couldn't be near anyone, they didn't look like they used to look. Modern day, it would be somebody that's thrown away their lives in addiction and uh, nothing going for them anymore. And all of a sudden, ten of those people would show up at your front door and they're, they're, they look so different. And you say, what happened to you? And that's, that's the situation here. So they show up at the priest. 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. There's nine Jewish lepers and there's one Samaritan. And believe me, I am not putting down the Jews because I, I have developed a conviction that whenever I... This is a historical story, so it's just the facts of the story. But I try to always say whenever I mention even a story like this, because we have a friend, a Jewish friend, that has made me very, very careful about this. Most of the early church leaders were Jewish. So when we read the negative side of the Jewish uh, religion, remember most of the early church leaders were Jewish. So let's keep a balance there always. And, uh, but it is amazing that Jesus, you know, he said at one point that he came onto his own and his own received him not. And he on several occasion, occasions, lifted out a, a Samaritan, which was a half-Jew, 
a mongrel race, they call it. They had little to do with each other. Remember the woman at the well? She was so surprised that Jesus sat and talked to her because she said them, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And then the story of the Good Samaritan, where again Jesus lifts out the Good Samaritan above some of the other people and shows him as a good man. This is one of those stories too. But one came back to give thanks. He didn't even, it looks like he didn't even get to the priest first. He came back to where the healing came. And would you say from reading this story that Jesus was impressed with that or not? He was impressed with that because that's what everybody should do. And all healing that ever comes, comes from God. I don't care if people are praying to an idol. If the healing comes, it's not because of the idol, it's because God healed. I hope you understand, understood that statement. You might be, the, the prayer might not be going any higher than the ceiling, but a healing comes. And a lot of people have gotten healed in, the, in this world that we're not praying people. God just has mercy. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Go around, go down the street, the first street today and meet people. Some are Christians, some are not. Everybody's getting oxygen. He's not saying, oh, well, everybody's getting it. Some will not acknowledge it. Some will not give thanks, but everybody's getting it. At the most basic level, God is so good to us all. But this man came back and gave thanks and... Um, that is the, the good news of this story. Um, kind of stay on the subject. I, there's a lot of things to be said about this, but I want to stay close to the subject. But think of the priest that day. There's a noise outside his house. Someone goes to look. They come back and say that some of the lepers want to see him. They say they are healed. And he says, how many are there? And they say, ten of them. And just suppose that that was all there was there, like I said earlier. He says, ten? All of them are there? They're all outside the gate. They want to talk to you. And he, looks, he goes out, and they're all smiling, and they're healthy looking. There's not a trace of leprosy. There's no modern-day application, no trace of sin. These people are at peace. I hope you follow me when I make those crossovers from the literal story to the application for us today because it's important to do that as a study of the Word. But he goes, how did this happen? First of all, he's going to ask questions. When someone gets saved and their lives, life is changed, people ask questions. I just saw this in an informal gather, gather, gathering we had last month at a McDonald's in Minneapolis. It's in an area where there's a lot of addiction. And one of the heroin addicts that we know came in off the street. And there was about 18 of us there playing Scrabble and talking. And, and one, of the, one of the 18 that was playing games that night was a guy that eight months ago was sleeping under the bridge with that other guy. They were homeless. And he walks right up to that table. He says, Dwayne, what happened to you? And Dwayne said, my life has changed. I'm, I'm, he said, you're sober, aren't you? He said, I've been sober for eight months. And the guy goes, man, I need to do what you did because what I'm doing isn't working. See? So the priest says, all of them, they're all looking so healthy. And they say, he says, how did it happen? And he say, they, they say to him, Jesus healed us and told us to come to you. Now, at this stage of Jesus' journey to the cross, this was like an earthquake. <laughs> it wasn't... One healed, it's ten healed, coming to the priest at the same time. And people that see that kind of deliverance, whether it was then or whether it's in 2015, they must do something with Jesus. You see? You are forced at that point to do something with him. You can reject him. That's what a lot of them did. Or you can accept him. But you will do something with him. And I have said, I, I think it's a true statement too, that the most pitiful person in the world is a person who never ever gets to see the deliverance of a leper, a sinner. The change. Because when you get that, and I believe everybody here has seen that, when you see that, 
you have something stored away that you can never throw away. You may discard it, but I mean by throwing away, you can never forget it. It's there. I have used the words, you have lost your intellectual virginity. You can't get it back. You know now that Jesus makes that difference. That's what happened with this priest. And um, I'm going to move on to some other things here. A few things about practical gratitude. Um, God. Well, let's just talk about the oxygen is supplied. That that God. That's like manna to the Israelites. We all get that. That's the first thing we need. In this city, everybody has clean water, so we don't need to talk about that. But food is the next thing. So, I always think that's a wonderful place to help people is is food because everybody needs it, and not everybody has it, and there's many variations of that. So I think it's. It's a great thing to have places like this, but even on a personal level, we can do that for people. When someone meets you on First Street and they want some money, uh, maybe not, probably not. Not always, but, but food, you can't really go wrong with that. Jesus fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000 in another place. It doesn't even tell us that, he, that there was a lot of thanks for it, but he fed them indiscriminately anyway. And... Um, I don't know how much thanks there was. I know what Jesus did when he fed the 5,000. Before he fed them, he gave thanks to the Father. So we should be doing that. And the other thing he did, whenever they were all fed and had enough, he gathered up the fragments that nothing was wasted. So that's a, we get that cue right from Jesus. So helping people with food. Um, look past your problem and see others have, who have much worse situations. This helps a lot and the gratitude issues. There's always someone that has it worse. Give in general ways. God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says. And Acts 20, 35 says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Build somebody up. If you think something good about them, don't do this as flattery, but if you're thinking something good about it, tell them. Pass it on. Uh, draw your strength from Jesus' word and not from ex expect, expect it or earn credits. We will do things for people and they will not show thanks. Trust God to deliver on his promises. This helps us too in a lot of our uh, helping others. Um, this story from the, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, just let me just briefly fill it in here. But Paul and Silas had got in trouble for doing something. And they were put in prison. And the prison keeper, the jailer, had him secured. He was, he, was, he was not a believer. He was not there. He was just doing his job. He's uh, running the jail. But suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened to everyone, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He was ready to commit suicide because they were going to kill him anyway. That's the way they worked that. If you don't keep these prisoners secure, you will lose your life. And he knew that, so he was going to do it himself. And as he's getting ready to commit suicide because the doors are open, he's sure the prisoners are all gone, Paul called with a loud voice saying, Don't do yourself any harm. Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, that is the jailer, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, see this, what happens? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's a desperate situation. What must I do to be saved? That's the first thing he asked. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them. This is what happens to the changed life. This is a man who probably was not very grateful. Now he's very grateful. And this is what he does. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Not a pleasant job either. 
he probably helped to put these stripes there. I don't know, but um, he washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. This is what he did further. Now, when he had brought them into his house, oh, real hospitality here, takes them to his house, and set food, set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And that is a very typical response from a member of the family of God. If we're a member of the family of God, we should have family likeness. And family likeness is like this. It's not all the same in the way we do it, and I, I, we can't have time to go into that, but we are a kind people. We are a generous people. We are a grateful people. We know that we have been delivered. This man was ready to commit suicide, and suddenly his life was changed. And this is what he did with it. So, I want to go to another scripture, and I want you to go with me on this one, and that's in Matthew 21 to 16. Matthew chapter 20, 1 to 16. It's on page, uh, it's on page 953. Matthew 20, 1 to 16. This is a parable. This is not a, this is not a true story. This is a, to make a point. And uh, when we get to reading here and we come to the word denarius, that's a form of currency in that day. We're not going to read denarius. We're going to read dollar so everybody understands that it, we'll just use dollar instead because it doesn't matter. It's a parable and it brings out the meaning just as well. So uh, Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a dollar a day, he sent them into his vineyard. I think there in verse 2 we see a group of people that really wanted a contract. Will you give us the money at the end of the day? If we do this, will you do that? The contract is established and uh, they agreed. He sent him into the vineyard. Verse 3, And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Now just, so, just in case someone's not with us here, this is a picture in 2015 of people, some get saved early, some get saved later, some get on board at different times in their life. And that's what this is talking about. The, so they went into the vineyard to work. Verse 5, again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a dollar. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a dollar. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. Hold up here. Had they not agreed to the dollar? Yes, they had. Saying, these last men have worked, verse 12, worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a dollar? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give, it, give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? This is the story. This is a parable about Jesus dealing with people. And it's a wonderful story because... If we are taking the measures that we use in our life, like on our job and all that, into this arena, which is the salvation picture, if we're taking that works idea in there that I should get more because I started earlier or whatever, we do not understand the magnificence and the tremendous gift that God gave us. We will never squabble about that. All we, If you come at the 11th hour... I have nothing but happiness for you. That's the kingdom of God. But what he shows these people, the Pharisees especially, this was intended for them mostly, is that you're trying to work your way to heaven. And what you become is an ungrateful person because you can never work your way to heaven. 
good works will follow. In fact, Ephesians talks about uh, works that have been foreordained before the foundation of the world. I mean, it's a big deal because godly people live like godly people. As somebody said, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it looks like a duck, it is a duck. If a Christian is a Christian, he acts like a Christian and he looks like a Christian. And he, and he treats people like a Christian. So I understand that. Works will follow, but we don't earn anything from that. And this story just congeals all that to say, this is an extravagant program, the plan of salvation, and you can never earn it by starting earlier or by doing more. That is a dead-end street because you, go, you might just feel like you're led to come and serve at the mission and help serve food. Well, if you serve once a week, should you serve twice a week, three times, four times? I mean, you can't do it that way. You do it because you love the people. You do it because it's the right thing to do. And in the process, God doesn't miss any of the details, but that is not the motivator. And these people were going back on their word. They had agreed to a dollar a day. The dollar is symbolic of the plan of salvation. And a dollar is all it takes in this parable. And it's, it's far more than any of us deserve, so who could complain? And a lot of the things that people do complain about is far more than they deserve. So it's the same kind of thing, but this is talking about the plan of salvation, this extravagant, beyond comprehension thing that we have a privilege of being a part of. These people in the beginning are self-centered in their works. This will certainly shed light on the sobering scenario of Matthew 25. Don't have time to go there, but you might want to check that out now after this little uh, insight. I go back to the la latter part of chapter 25 of Matthew and see these people who said, haven't we done all these things? We've done this, we've done that. And he says, I never knew you. This is that kind of person. We must know where we have gotten this gift from and how we got it. And it's a pure gift. It's nothing but a gift. So, very important to understand that. It is backwards to the way we naturally operate. From childhood on, we earned our place in life. We have learned that good performances are rewarded and poor performance punished. How does one suddenly receive something so wonderful that has nothing to do with the performance? I just have a few more thoughts to give. I'm having trouble finding them right now. Okay, I talked about things we can do if we're grateful people. We, we skimmed over that. I just want to leave the, the end of subject by saying, to warn you about some gratitude killers. Some of the things that lower the quotient big time. And, of course, self-centeredness is the first one. We all deal with some level of self-centeredness. But a believer in Jesus and a follower of Jesus should be much different than a person who is not following Jesus. And uh, this is something we should always be thinking about. Here's some really practical things that I think have helped me and have helped others, too. These are gratitude killers. Talk radio. You might, that might surprise you, but I don't care if it's left or right. I don't care if it's Amy Goodman or if it's Michael Savage. I don't care which end of the spectrum. This kind of thing as a continuous feed kills gratitude. That's the way I find it. It's not a healthy diet. A little bit of it I think would be okay. But if you go that way and, and one side's trashing the other and the other side's trashing the other and it's all, all kinds of things, they even get into conspiracy theories, which I hate. And they're very damaging too to gratitude. There's just a lot of things to avoid. Negative people, don't hang around with them too much if they're affecting you in a negative way. If, they're, if you're finding yourself being, losing your joy, uh, becoming ungrateful because you're around too many people like that, pull away. Time out. Uh, angry people, comparing with others. In that, yeah, it's amazing how much debt is put on credit cards to keep up with who? Comparing ourselves among ourselves. Boredom, laziness, can gratefulness thrive in this context? 
even the, even the media advertising, it works against gratitude. We have to be careful about all this. We need to check it by the word and make sure that our hearts are in the right place. I have a closing question too, and that is, um, can a, and I'm not going to give answers to this because it's way too big to, to congeal right here, and I, I couldn't if I tried anyway. Can a grateful person, a truly grateful person, be depressed? Can a depressed person be grateful? I said I'm not going to give answers to this. This is going to be the, this is going to be the question I leave on the table. But I will say this, at least I could say this much safety, safely. The more grateful we are, I think the more healthy we will be. And so we, I think one of the practical things we could do is pray to Jesus, pray to God for more gratefulness, to be more happy, to be more thankful for what we have. And show that. So I think that's a practical thing we can do. We're out of time. Thank you for your attention. We're going to have a prayer, and uh, I believe there's a meal provided here. So thank you, Lord Jesus, again for being with us here today. Thank you for all these precious people that came to the service today. We just pray that you would be with each one of us as we journey on. And uh, thank you for the lessons that you give us from your word. Lord, we thank you for the food that's been prepared, too. Help us to be grateful people today. And thank you for what you have given us. In your name we pray. Amen.